So just to define what biomaterial is, biomaterial is uh, defined as a non-viable material. It means it is a non-living material used in a medical device intended to interact with biological system. Uh, but now the terms have become more generic. Now, instead of non-viable, we also have started working with viable, like maybe any you know, implants, like tissue implants or heart transplants, so they also become a viable material and they're intended to interact with biological system. In addition, biocompatibility is defined as the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific application. The reason I'm highlighting these two phrases, an appropriate host response, because it, uh, it means that the material what we're implanting should not lead to any side effects. It means it should not have any clotting of blood. It should not lead to any infection. It should not lead to any, you know, of, uh, it should lead in a normal healing process. That's why that's what is an appropriate host response. So our body should not start acting very differently. In a specific application means that I, uh, what is the intention of implantation will also depend on how long we want the device to be in. Like for a syringe, it comes in contact and we remove it within a few seconds. Just after it has delivered whatever it has to. Uh, for some dialysis and all or catheters, they may stay in the body from hours to weeks. And materials like you know hip joints or uh, knee joints, they may stay for lifetime. And something which is not toxic for a few seconds may become toxic if it is there in the body for longer duration. That's why I thought I'll define these two terms biomaterial and biocompatibility and they're taken from Williams right now. And again, one more part to highlight while effectiveness is important, safety is mandatory. It means that if I'm using an implant to help me with functionality, it should not hamper anything else you know, in the body. So safety is of utmost importance. And the way things started, they started with bio developing bio inert materials in 1940s, 1950s after World War One. So things had to stay in body to replenish that functionality. Then came with bioactive material, they will also start interacting with the bones and tissues. And that was the goal to work with also resorbable material. Then around 1990s, it was more on tissue regeneration. That is third generation material, like the way we see for Dr. Lizard in Spider-Man movie. Uh, we can define the materials based on the class, which can be polymer, metal, ceramic, composite. That is very well known to people, uh, people like us. There can be other classes like based on material response, and this definition is taken by mainly by biologists or bio, biomedical engineers, how the material is, whether it is bioactive, bioinert, bioresorbable or toxic. There can be another definition from mechanical perspective, whether it is structural or non-structural in nature. I'm just wanting to highlight that any material can be taken in all the three classes. So I can have a metal, which is a bio, uh, bio say bioactive uh, in nature or toxic in nature and for structural application. So they can be fit in anywhere in the three, depending on how they are behaved. And again, it is a multidisciplinary area because we require people to design the material, mechanically see how it is behaving and then translate them with some functional biological functionality. You require some chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, biomedical engineers, then doctors, clinicians to take it forward. Lawmakers, at, uh, you know, at, at, for basically, and for commercializing, you also need uh, multiple firms and manufacturing units to come in then legals, uh, legal advice also is required if you want to implement and take it for uh, to market for clinical trials. So those, that's how things are basically defined. And we are mainly worried about or interested in this hip joint architecture. Uh, just to highlight, from, we have a femoral head, which can be metal or ceramic. We have a polymeric liner, which is polymer. Then you have a metal backing and on, on top of it, you typically have a ceramic coating. And that's how it gets implanted in the hip region, this part. And again, we, there are multiple uh, complexions which can arise. First thing is, uh, I'm using a polymer liner against a metal or a ceramic femoral head. Uh, that is, uh, okay, let me put it this way. If I use ceramic to ceramic, that is the best joint. But society will not accept because with every step, I will have a screeching sound. Chi, 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 chi. Not acceptable. If I use a metal, then metal lines are toxic. So I need to make the joint very smooth. And that is why we always use a ceramic femoral head and a polymeric liner. But now imagine the hardness difference is so high. I need to play with, you know, engineer it so that I can minimize the damage at the same time, not leading to any cytotoxic.
Professor Balani, we seem to have lost your voice. Was I logged out? Yes, uh, the system uh, kind of. Uh... Okay, okay. So did we lose? Uh, maybe I will start sharing it again. Yes, yes. I've already made you co-host. Please uh, reshare. Okay. So uh, did you? Did, did I say this earlier? I mean, did you? Ah uh, no, we were on the previous slide. You lost us there. Okay, here. Yes, yes. Okay. This was so kind of almost completed. You were towards the end. Okay. So essentially, we have to work with functionality so that we can you know, make this material uh, integrate naturally with the bone because bone is a natural material and we want the material also to integrate naturally. And that is why we have hydroxypatite uh, as a coating. And this coating, you can see it is done on the femoral stem. So it naturally binds. And hydroxypatite is a chemical nature, same as that of bone and teeth. We add some additives like aluminum oxide, zirconia for providing toughening, but they are bio inert in nature. So they compromise a little bit on the activity of the material. So it will, the cells will be there, but they will not be osteogenic in nature. They will not create new or create new binding sites. So carbon nanotube also is added as an addition. And again, there are two schools of thoughts. Some say that CNT being nanometric in size can act as a needle and then puncture the cell and kill the cell. But I, I, but I come from a school of thoughts which says that carbon is a form of life. And why should it kill the cell? So I'll also emphasize, you know, why we say it so. And you know, I have, we have some evidence that shows that CNTs are not toxic if they are integrated within the matrix. We also have worked on developing functionally graded material and that's what I will highlight. So we'll try to highlight what has been, you know, we have been doing for last 10, 12 years. So toughening in ceramics is pretty tricky. And typically we have, we require a very fine grain nanostructure, secondary phase and transformation toughening to impart toughening to ceramics. And here we have taken a hydroxypatite nanometric in size. We have spray dried them so I can get a good agglomerate and get good flowability. And I get some material hydroxypatite. And then we have also added aluminum oxide around 20 weight percent and I name it as HA-A. In the third compo composition, we have taken some carbon nanotube. We have mixed it with aluminum oxide. So we have totally 20 weight percent. Out of that, we have 1.6 weight percent carbon nanotube and remaining is nano aluminum oxide. So total weight content is still uh, 20 weight percent. And we say it as A16C. It is 1.6 weight percent carbon. 18.4% aluminum oxide and remaining is hydroxypatite. And then we deposit them as a coating. And this is a typical feedstock. You know, though the powders look like nano uh, micrometer in size. If I zoom it up, I can see nanoparticles. So I can see there are nanoparticles and uh, I hope you're able to see the CNTs which are also laid in in an aluminum oxide matrix. So alumina is typically 150 nanometer in size. Carbon nanotube is 40 to 70 nanometer and hydroxypatite, it is a nanometric uh, material, but we have put them into a globular form of 10 to 50 micrometer. And this is how the CNTs are well dispersed in hydroxypatite matrix. I don't need a separate treatment for dispersing carbon nanotube. I don't have to functionalize them. And they're automatically getting dispersed on hydroxypatite surface. We also have carried out molecular modeling and it tells that CNTs automatically tend to disperse because of the bonding with surface calcium atoms which are there on hydroxypatite. And this is still unpublished, but this is part we are able to you know, attribute that to dispersion of carbon nanotube without any functionalization. We have taken this material. We also utilize spark plasma sintering for densifying this as a centered pellet so we can carry out some tests and assess some properties. And there are typical parameters of temperature, time, and pressure, which we have varied. And here we can see that uh, we get some porosity around nine to five to nine percent. And we require porosity, especially in the coating, because now it allows the fibers, the natural fib fibroblasts to anchor with the, with the artificial material. So that is somehow required that we have some porosity. But here we are getting around 95, 91 to 95% densification. 
and here we can also see there is a certain distribution of phases i automatically get some tricalcium phosphate i also get crystalline hydroxyapatite one thing i would like to highlight that this can be controlled via processing especially in elderly people we require a material which can stay because you know the healing process is a little slower for a younger person we want the dissolvable phase which is tricalcium phosphate to be high in content because bone automatically is remodeling in uh, younger patients so in that case we can also control it by processing but here our intention is not so so but we are getting both alpha as well as you know hydroxyapatite as well as tricalcium phosphate in the system so we have hydroxyapatite with aluminum oxide and with some carbon nanotube but with carbon nanotube we are not able to see any carbon nanotube in x-ray diffraction so we have done raman spectroscopy and here we do see the defect in the graphitic peak which match as that of the starting material this work was done around 10 12 years back so this is what we started with and then we could see that we have hydroxyapatite we have aluminum oxide we also see carbon nanotube within the matrix which is well dispersed and then cnt's also the carbon nanotubes also tend to act as a bridge so once we are trying to damage them uh, damage them or break them we do see this bridges which are being formed and the toughness is actually much higher you know when we add carbon nanotube and in addition so we also have tried to see how to attribute this toughness so we have developed a fractal model and that is helpful for defining how the crack actually is propagating so once we take a matrix we see how the crack might propagate if the if we have elongated alumina or we have a carbon nanotube we also extend this to hydroxyapatite based system and this extra path leads to extra toughness and experimental toughness of hydroxyapatite with cnt is around to the tune of around 0.6 to 2 uh, and theoretically we can assume it uh, estimated to be 1.1 to 2.17 but what i want to highlight is if i take lower content of carbon nanotube like in aluminum oxide matrix you will see that i have the estimation 4.05 to 4.8 experiment value is 4.6 when i go for higher content of carbon nanotube my experimental values are near the lower bound and that is why it will happen because cnt's tend to agglomerate when cnt's agglomerate in aluminum oxide they will be more towards lower bound and here you can see the hydroxyapatite with carbon nanotube it is well within as i is around 2 megapascal root meter in terms of fractal toughness okay? so this is what i wanted to highlight secondly uh, maybe i may not spend much time on it but you will also appreciate that if i have a cnt and there is a pull out of cnt crack is a crack has to propagate extra path and so with increasing pull out length i am getting a increase in the toughness so i can see there is a increase so this line is increasing this line is increasing and these are lower and upper bounds and you will expect higher toughness in higher cnt content so when cnt content is 8 weight percent i am getting a higher toughness that is you know looks very well validated and intuitively right on the left hand side if i see that cnt diameter so i am seeing a marginal decrease if you can see this part it is a marginal decrease in fracture toughness with increasing cnt diameter but on the other end if you will appreciate the circumference of a cnt with a larger diameter is high so if i take 40 versus 70 nanometer 70 nanometer will have higher cnt uh, uh, circumference but then why the fracture toughness is decreasing that is because we have calculated this value for a fixed volume content of carbon nanotube 6 volume percent around and on that a lower diameter cnt will be actually more in number and that is why we see a increase when we go to a lower cnt diameter and that's what i think is not intuitively incorrect that is also technically correct and we could also translate that that to wear resistance so we performed a certain uh, scratching and from that we can observe the wear resistance can become as high by more than 35 13 times when we add 20 weight percent aluminum oxide and with mere addition of 1.6 weight percent carbon nanotube we can go to wear resistance as high as six more than 65 times this was very surprising very surprising but nonetheless we got it from micro scratching and in terms of compatibility uh, we could see that uh, we are getting unhindered you know growth of cells like mouse fibroblasts even when we have carbon nanotube so they are not dying they are still growing unhindered 
and we could see compatibility. So we can see once we have bio inert aluminum oxide addition, I see a decrease in bio compatibility. But when we when we add just 1.8 percent carbon nanotube, it comes back to 100 percent. Right. So that is the advantage. Whether it's a three day or five day, we still get enhanced cyto compatibility. And also in terms of toughness, it is more than doubling. It's more than doubling. And you require a minimum of around two megapascal root meter to serve as a cyto compatible and integral structurally integral integrated coating. So the minimum number is 1.5 to 2 megapascal root meter, and that part we're able to achieve in both. Only thing is in alumina, I may have to compromise on cyto compatibility, but with carbon nanotube. i don't compromise on that in earlier work by uh, uh, this laura hayden's group and also akazaka's group they have shown that cnt's act as a platform on which appetite can grow so this is their work from hayden's group and uh, akazaka's group and our work on this part also had established that we the cnt's are cyto compatible and we see appetite precipitation on the carbon nanotubes So this part also was affirmed via uh, this particular you know, publication earlier. Uh, later on, I think it was a serendipity that we start. We were working on thermal barrier coatings, so we were working on aluminum oxide with yttrium stabilized zirconia additions, and those were in the order of nanometer, my sub micrometer, and speed right. And we were expecting a lot of improvement here, but now you can see once we are. incorporating them i am getting big chunks here here so they are not actually dispersed that nicely because nanometer size i should not see them this as a cluster and following that we developed some models but we also had a look at what fracture toughness is so fracture toughness was very similar but i'm using nanometer size micrometer size or spread right agglomerate of yttrium stabilized zirconia but there is a definite improvement from aluminum oxide but we do see that the influence of size is not that much and that is probably because we were not able to disperse it that uh, appropriately uh, in current uh, newer approach this year we have tried something and we are able to get uh, much improvement but this was i think quite some time like 8 8 9 years back but we see an improvement so we thought let us use this idea, uh, idea and make functionally graded material and we could also associate this crack propagation termination to yttria stabilized zirconia and transformation of monoclinally to tetragonal phase so that part we could attribute that to so then we came on to directly developing this functionally graded biocomposite and the process was not simple because each one if i have to center in c2 all the three composites of surface which is hap hydroxypetite with alumina interlayer which is aluminum oxide and yttrium stabilized zirconia and the bulk which is yttrium stabilized zirconia alone why this design because i want surface to be highly bioactive i want the bulk to be highly tough and as you might know that yttrium stabilized zirconia is known as steel of ceramics but if i use very brittle hydroxypetite and i interface it with tough yttrium stabilized zirconia any impact will delaminate them so i need to have a cushion layer and that is intermediate and now each one has a different sintering temperature different sintering time and different densification so it took us some challenge but ultimately we could get a stack and we you know this functionally graded material we could make it as a stack and with some optimized condition we went through again phase analysis we could see that we are right now we did not want any tri calcium phosphate and that part we could attain in uh, sps we could get this retained uh, tetragonal zirconia phase because i want the transformation to happen to monoclinic phase with enhance uh, toughening so that part i am able to retain i am able to retain tetragonal zirconia in the system you could also see that uh, everything is cyto compatible here everything is appearing green because they also have this self fluorescence property so aluminum oxide is a self fluorescence so that's why you seeing everything green but typically if i quantify i will get to know that the cells are more on the hydroxypetide and they are very less on alumina and yz and that part we could com compare with the standard which is a positive control polymer disc and we could compare that and now here you can see this is a control sample and with hap the numbers of cells grow go very high whereas aluminum oxide and yttrium stabilized zirconia they have similar numbers as that of a control sample right so whether we took uh, l925 fiber fibroblast or saos2 you know uh, osteoblast cell this is the 
trend you can you know automatically come it means that hydroxypeptide is biocompatible and i'm losing out on the biocompatibility on the other ones but i'm not expecting that from them i just want them to be tough but in summary i we could get graded toughness on the surface i want good biocompatibility and we are getting that cells are you know are getting aligned i want a intermediate layer to provide intermediate toughness so coating should not spell off i'm getting a very nice integrated interface as a cushion layer and then bulk which is giving the highest toughness of 66.5 megapascal per meter so that part we could actually manufacture and make uh, some time back the second concept was whether silver uh, whether carbon nanotube is toxic or not so we made a pellet of only carbon nanotube and then we said oh, we also want to look at the antibacterial nature of silver so we added silver as well in each one and we could establish that uh, so these are the this is a gram negative bacteria this is a gram positive bacteria so just want to see independence of any bacteria we see that hydroxypeptide bacterial density is very high and same is so for carbon nanotube there is no decrease in cell density but when we add silver automatically the density goes down and same thing happens in the gram negative bacteria effects might be different but that is the underlying or take home message and we could also establish why this mechanism so because silver that tends to be nature of the dna and at the same time if i keep adding silver it also lowers down the cytocompatibility so if i take fibroblast cell uh, so in this case also i tend to see a decrease in the cytocompatibility i would like to have at least this number but more than 28% i start to see a decrease in the cell viability and also uh, bacteria count is definitely decreasing so whether i take gram uh, positive or gram negative the bacterial count is also decreasing but the normal cell also starts to get affected by it so i would like to keep my silver content below 28% and again we could uh, link that to logic why it is able to kill the bacteria at lower content whereas the cell the osteoblast cell can survive that um, can take a look at the paper we also had a look at the fracture toughening contribution by each factor whether it is a carbon nanotube or silver and but interestingly we saw here that if i take this uh, particular you know uh, uh, co co uh, this particular uh, graph then we can appreciate that for the lower content so in this case i have a carbon nanotube which is 4 weight percent so in earlier time the values are near carbon nanotube when there is no silver but as and when we add, uh, start adding silver it starts touching the upper bound which means that silver is a better toughening agent than carbon nanotube because in metals metal uh, the there is always a plastic deformation it also tends to blunt the crack and that part cnts cannot provide it cannot blunt it can flex it can provide enhancement and elastic modulus but that uh, distribution of crack tip energy will not be accommodated by the cnt alone so that part we could appreciate and we established that metals are actually better toughening agents than even carbon nanotube then our intention was also to develop porous scaffolds and porosity also tends to interact with you know uh, cells and we could develop porous scaffold using zinc oxide zinc oxide also is antibacterial agent we could establish the cytocompatibility uh, then also we added silver and again we could see the effects of porosity and porosity was very dominant in terms of encouraging cell growth and again we could highlight what is the level of antibacterial efficacy with porosity so porosity allows enhanced interaction because it provides enhanced surface area so that way it could provide higher antibacterial efficacy then we went on to seeing getting multifunctionality so we also started adding cerium oxide so yes we require anti infection with the addition of silver or zinc oxide but also we want expedited healing so like the way we eat fruits fruits have antioxidant they actually help us replenish our dead cells much faster and that part we could establish by addition of serum oxide so i will not take you through but antibacterial effect is coming mainly because of silver but expedited healing is coming out mainly because of serum oxide and good interaction is coming out from carbon nanotube that's why this particular work actually made a lot of impact in the materials science engineering scene 
two two and a half three years back. We could also attribute what is the unended cell growth in these samples, and also we could see filopodial extensions which are not seen in the earlier case. So it is uh, hinting that the intercellular connection is very strong, and now you have fibers which are now connecting very nicely and spreading also very nicely on the uh, implant surface. And we could also establish that what is the how this uh, antioxidation actually is occurring. So you have also a presence of cerium three plus. No, that is becoming cerium oxide CO two uh, with the four plus by taking up extra oxygen, and now we are getting from C two O three to C two O four or CO two. So that part we could establish via, you know, uh, XPS X-ray photo electron spectroscopy. And again, we could establish the excess oxygen that is being taken up by these particular system in comparison to without C and without Syria and then with Syria. So that part we could actually establish. So this is only with Syria, and in this case, so we could see there is an increase in the way it is absorbing that oxygen. Apparently, oxygen becomes an oxide ion as a reactive oxygen species, and that ROS you know is highly active and starts killing whatever comes in its uh, in its path. Whether it's a live cell, whether it's a dead cell, whether it's a, you know any uh, pathogen, it is very much required for killing something, and that part can be absorbed by serum oxide to reduce the biotic stress. So we could establish how the optimal you know uh, design of the system actually gets in by making it multifunctional, having antibacterial at the same time having antioxidant property, and that is what is coming in the optimized system. Uh, we also went on uh, very recently. We started doping hydroxypyrite itself with zinc, with cobalt, and also a mixture of those two. We also tried adding copper. Uh, that part I have not presented, but we see that cobalt is a better antibacterial agent. And secondly, and more importantly, I can dope zinc either in a OH channel or a calcium or calcium channel. So uh, hydroxypyrite is CA10. PO4 whole six OH twice, so I can put calcium uh, zinc on the calcium side or on the OH side, but I see that if it goes in the O, Yes, are we back? Yes, we are back. So I, I just want to highlight that now by processing, we can control where we want to, you know, dope this uh, zinc or cobalt, whether on a calcium side or on OH side, and how the emanating bacterial response should be. So that part we could establish very recently. And once we put something in body, uh, there is also an issue of infection. So during surgery, whether you know when the when the operation is going on, the door may open multiple number of times, you know, and uh, typically it opens around 60 times during a surgery. Uh, maybe the nurses may not wash their hands properly, or even the surgical tools may not be properly sterilized. That leads to infection. There might be typically five to ten percent infection, but the surgery costs two to three times more, and the trauma the person goes because they recently had a surgery and they have to. Undergo the surgery again. That becomes very traumatic. So, how to take care of that? And typically, the infection process is so that you have planktons uh, out here. They have plankton, and they tend to develop or colonize. They will find a surface. Then they will tend to form a biofilm. Once it forms a biofilm, the bacteria becomes resistant to antimicrobials or any drugs, and then it starts to spread. Once it spread, they some of them die because of the you know uh, insufficient uh, nutrition to the bacteria. Then they will tend to release the planktons again, and then 
they will spread to a different region and again the process continues so from planktonic regime when they are plankton to interaction regime when they become resistant to antimicrobials and lethal regime uh, people tend to see this along the x axis but as engineers i think our tendency to also see or appreciate y axis and here we get adhesion force so just by looking at adhesion force i can understand whether the bacteria is in the planktonic regime interaction regime or lethal regime if they, the value is typically few nanonutrients i will know that they are in the planktonic regime and that's where i can stop i can treat even my own immune response can take care of those planktons once they are in the body but once they establish or develop a biofilm then even drugs may be actually fail in terms of controlling the infection so planktonic regime can be treated but interaction regime regime will cause and also lead to infection and typically in our body we have metal ceramic polymers so here we have taken a model system of two metals stainless steel and titanium one ceramic hydroxypatite and one polymer and we also used one model bacteria s aureus to see how the deadhesion strength will be and typically if you will observe uh, the architecture of anything in the body will have metal like titanium stainless steel in the hip joint you also have polymeric liner your ceramic uh, ceramic femoral head so you basically have everything in the joint wherever you want it to be and now i have a bacteria which is very small order of few micrometers and if you want to appreciate our thickness of our hair is around 100 micrometers we are talking about 100 times smaller than that so there are various qualitative as well as quantitative techniques how do we get to you know quantify the adhesion force and there are various tools which are available i will not get into that but there can be spinning there can be pressure at which it is deadhering there can be number of times i am washing the cell as a or at what rpm i am the cell is getting detached so there are qualitative tools but i can also have a quantitative tool using using nano scratching or even using afm optical tweezers and most suited is afm because this is the number or value i was looking at few nano newtons so this is the optimal tool which we have selected and gone ahead with afm and here we uh, take this afm tip we attach a bacteria uh, using some glue that's a separate process in itself and then we have tested various surfaces like polymeric stainless steel titanium hydroxypatite and we'll see the deadhesion force so we bring this tip closer to the substrate hold it for 0 second then retract it 5 second retract it and 10 second retract it now let me take you to a curve so like say for example this for 0 second you will see there is some deadhesion force that the red curve if i hold the bacteria closer to the in contact with the substrate for say longer time of 5 second i can see the force adhesion force is increased i keep it for 10 seconds it is further increase not only that the distance or the length of protein which is attached also increases for 0 second was some for blue it became higher and then for 10 seconds it became even even higher right and you will also appreciate the values are typically different between the three polymer ceramic and metal so highest values are seen in metal like order of 10 15 nano newton then second or the least is in polymeric surface order of 2 3 4 nano newton and intermediate in ceramic which is 4 to 6 nano newton right this is what we are able to get experimentally and after multiple number of tests i can separate them out i can you know basically take this number of events and i can put them into short range and long range interactions short range and long range interactions because there will be multiple number of proteins and it is like how many such events are occurring so how many such chains are getting attached so if i have a material to be carried away then how many chains i will attach to it and that number is given by k and what is the strength of the long range forces is given by flr whereas fsr short range force dictate how strong the infection will be right so short range are more towards whether infection will spread further or not and flr is how strong that interaction is right i would have also highlighted with one more slide uh, i will just say it so uh, conventionally if you want to see the addition i'm sorry 
we will go with something called as a, a direct contact test or agar diffusion test and from that if we assess we will observe that maybe i should have used one more slide you will see that the maximum number of dead cells are there in uh, maximum number of dead cells are there in ceramic hydroxyapatite so inherently or conventionally i will choose only ceramic but here i am getting to see that the least forces are there in polymer so this finding actually disapproved the conventional knowledge that the minimal addition force is there in polymer and not in ceramic typically conventionally what we would have chose we would have chosen we would have chosen hydroxyapatite but actually it is polymer which is actually easier to disinfect we also have seen uh, we want to visualize this uh, these events so we also have done computational modeling which got recently published last year uh, early uh, early or uh, late last year november december sometime uh, and this part we took various proteins uh, staphylococcal protein a clumping factor uh, serin rich s protein but what i want to highlight is they are of different weights different lengths different weights apparently that doesn't make a difference when it comes to addition strength uh, so that part we could actually establish but it matters a lot what your substrate is and for simulations we start and then we end and we know only the starting and ending structure we do not know what has happened in between but in between now we get the forces so i know something would have happened at p1 so then i redo the modeling i start at zero and then end at p1 and then at p1 i get to see oh what has happened so initially whatever the structure was i have destroyed the region 4 and region 5 then i started p1 i end at p2 and p2 i see oh, there was a uh 310 helix which actually has been destroyed at p2 so now i start to see events visualize them at each force and now i could link it to the experimental value what we have gotten earlier and you can see uh, okay by the way the forces here are in nano uh, pico newtons whereas here we are giving them in nano newtons so i should have put the peak pn and they are of similar value order of 2.5 2.53 nano newtons and that's what we are able to link it to number we have to multiply them by the number of such events and we are able to establish that so in summary we could highlight that polymer has the least short range force and the least long range force and the least number of events conventionally i would have chosen hydroxyapatite because it shows maximum number of dead cells but the short range force is very high long range force also is very high the number of events are small it has less number of bacteria on its surface but they are very strongly adhered but in polymer i can wash them and i can remove the bacteria from the surface but on the other end if you see the short range long range force they are pretty substantial and number of events also are very high when we talk about metal and i think it took lot of effort it took i think more than a year or so of committed work on this and even when the revision so we had submitted this paper in 2019 and we took one extra year to revise and redo the simulations and that part i think was very you know very much accepted and appreciated by this community so we could see that how they are actually unfolding uh, if you give me 5 more minutes i will also highlight the polymeric part so polymer uh, also is utilized as a you know as a liner acetabular cup liner and ultra molecular polyethylene is established to be very good so there are, there are multiple polymers like uh, high, high density polyethylene or polytetrafluoroethylene or polyacetyl but ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is one of the well established material for liner and now we could see that we could add more reinforcement like aluminum oxide carbon nanotube and various others and we can now control their contact angle we also appreciated that we can control the dispersion fraction of this surface and we can get appetite or we can get altered metabolic activity on the surfaces we also appreciated or we uh, assessed its mechanical strengthening we also did some trabological studies using fretting and you know with and without with addition of silver and zinc oxide and antibacterial agents this was actually published some time back but now we also wanted to venture into what will happen if we are doing some radiation damage ultraviolet uh, radiation as well as gamma radiation because gamma radiation is the you know accepted process of sterilizing the liner and but now that had a very different effect on neat polymer that is ultra high molecular polyethylene 
and then certain composites which are with addition of aluminum oxide or hydroxyapatite or carbon nanotube or a mixture of these you know uh, aluminum oxide hydroxyapatite and carbon nanotube so that part we could establish uh, very recently in general of, general of material research and technology we also saw that there is a decrease in the performance of the composites whereas there is a enhancement in the performance of uh, ultra high molecular polythene without any uh, additor and that is only in terms of mechanical property like high, uh, hardness and elastic modulus but when it comes to tribological property uh, things are a little different so the scratch resistance actually in, uh, gets enhanced in the uh, composite because they provide certain reinforcements and uh, lubrication which is not there in polymer alone and the damage also gets unsus unsustained after the uv and gamma sterilization so that part we could appreciate and recently we had published this and currently we are also venturing into doing performing some finite element modeling this has recently been communicated to composite science and technology and we are observing what will be the damage accumulation if i get to see there is a increased uh, thickness of the liner and also the separation between the liner and the femoral head actually changes so that part we have recently communicated and how the mechanism what are the wear rates that actually exist so we could see that uh, with the carbon nanotube we are getting the lowest wear rate uh, almost half but with a poor interface the wear rate can also increase and that part we could establish and that is communicated still in the peer review and we could also establish the viability of these particular systems we can have, you know we can also see that after uv or gamma radiation the surface gets exposed it actually uh, uh, basically you are breaking the bonds on the surface creating some free bonds or functionalizing it and that will enhance the wettability or lower down the contact angle and that helps in enhanced cell growth i'll just take two more minutes and then i will stop uh, so this part we could establish in terms of crystallization mechanical property and tribological property of base polymer and with uh, some reinforcement recently we also ventured into creating some textures on the surface by so we try to control the fraction of the texture on on these surfaces and that changes the surface energy so i get to see an increase in surface energy and increase in surface energy actually is leading to a decreased uh, cell uh, bacterial viability so we could just see that if you are if you are creating a texture that is enhancing the contact angle and that means there is a less wettability of the surface and by that we also are getting lower bacterial growth on these surfaces so that part we could uh, establish using this textures uh, texturing on of this particular surface and they were for both uh, for all metal polymer as well as ceramic so this part we could uh, take it forward very recently this work was actually uh, published so in summary i will basically uh, give you a light that we are wanting to create a porous scaffold with multi functionality adding add addition of zinc oxide silver and also anti oxidant cerium oxide and also we are able to visualize this uh, events using computational modeling on a polymeric liner though i did not highlight but we are adding zinc oxide silver and we are assessing how can we tailor the anti microbial property by playing with the morphology of zinc oxide and we also have tested mechanical tribological property and on the femoral head side we are trying to create texture in an enhancing you know lubrication how can we enhance the lubrication and avoid any cell contact on that and that part we are trying to do with some certain texturing and also certain you know engineering of the femoral head that part is also going on so this is actually a summary of you know my goal work on biomaterial and in the end i'll conclude that we could successfully make this hydroxyapatite based systems with enhanced stuffing functional grading at the same time we could establish how the bacterial effects are uh, bacterial effects are on various biosurfaces which are real life biosurfaces metals show the strongest adhesion and conventionally we proved it wrong that it is not hydroxyapatite but polymer that is you know has uh, has better easiness in terms of removing the bacterial adhesion and we could also see or sense the effect of uh, irradiation ultraviolet and gamma and how texture effects will also affect the antibacterial efficacy to finally develop this multifunctional biomaterials for orthopedic <laughs> application as a potential body implant material and i would acknowledge various collaborators i i will not name everyone but i also thank the funding agencies and also mr sudhakar bonde and dr vivek for giving me this opportunity and asm india for you know, hosting it
i thank you all for your patient listening i hope i did not go overboard i go overboard i am just finishing on time 8:30 so i think i'll be taking up any question and thanks a lot for your patient listening thanks a lot thank thank you professor balani it was in, indeed a very interesting lecture and uh, quite an eye opener for many of us probably who are learning about biomaterials first hand from you from a new perspective uh, now we have our chair mr bonde here uh, i will request him to speak a little about the chapter and then we'll come to the question sir if it is okay with you perfect uh, to, to, over to mr bonde first of all my apologies for joining late because i was occupied with our industrial matter because there is a flood area in this chipluun and mahar so we were trying to send him some relief material so i got late sorry for that first of all i welcome professor kantesh balani and he is my guru because i am a kanpur iit fellow so from that respect he is one of my guru and from the same department uh coming back to the point uh we have today he has consented because we are trying to form the different groups for example archaeometallurgy biomaterials nanomaterials we are over forming 10 groups and i want assistance and help and guidance from professor kantesh balani on the biomaterial section and he has kindly consented for that so i am thankful to him and will be utilizing his uh, expertise for our benefit of our chapter that is one thing i have to, i have to tell you that uh regarding the chapter thing now today the attendance is thin uh we are regularly repeating about our chapter we have more than 250 members at present and we have the modest target of crossing 3 300 members by this year end so that is our target so we'll be needing help of professor kantesh balani and other guys next month we might be coming to kanpur also and see you that time but you will be associated with our only our chapter only not you will be joining kanpur chapter that is the first thing and because we don't want to lose you otherwise also and other thing is as far as the other activities are concerned so now i highlighted a thing we are trying to renovate the thing we are trying to be up to date with the uh, technological development we don't want to be the conventional metallurgists so we want to have the metal scientists as well and get benefit of the knowledge from people like you and uh, next year uh, next time we'll be having something on this nanomaterial also and uh, other uh, conventional areas also so, so that is a part so i am thankful again to you and now i request uh, dr vivek singhal to proceed with the question and answer session thank you thank you very much thank and you. i acknowledge the presence of professor ravi he jo- he has joined from the canada so i welcome you sir i i all participants can unmute if they wait, uh, do wish so uh, i have actually only two questions in the chat i would request the two participants to ask the questions first starting with professor ravi professor ravi you uh, please ask your question you have to unmute yeah okay i will i have done that uh, I, it's a very lucid, engaging, and comprehensive presentation by our erudite scholar. Uh, just I wonder whether, rather, really enjoyed listening to him, and uh, he he's enjoy he's enjoying giving the presentation as well. We see that, <laughs> and uh, that's wonderful. Uh, the any comment on uh, Professor Balani? Any comment on the life of the implants? Any replacement issues? Bio compatibility issues? Can you just uh, say a few words about these, please? so typically the lifetime they say uh, for any implant 7 uh, plus years uh, they the survival rate is pretty much more than 90% but things starts to deteriorate after 10 years and things are very different in india because uh, there is no uh, i mean record keeping as such in india so if person is doing well they don't come back if things become very bad then also they don't come back the same doctor so the record keeping is very different and very odd Uh, but i remember that uh, the cg uh, property nft dc dr bala subramaniam has uh, gotten into designing a new type of a <coughs> knee joint and that's what they are taking it forward with a new mechanism new design so that's uh, another part but if i come to what manufacturers are uh, i see there is not much engagement in terms of what that implant can do because when the firms come to sell 
I know there are some like Zimmer or Stryker. They come to the doctors, and they come will will come that this is a new functionality. Maybe it is engaging with the joint nicely. The stress distribution is much better in this particular joint, and the doctor will take it on its face value. That surgeon will take it on its face value, and they will just go by. I think I don't know how to say it, but maybe they'll go on what the recommendation of the manufacturer is, or the cut they can get, or the lower price they can actually afford. So that way they try to take a call, and they will get to know only seven, ten years later. I mean, so that also becomes an issue. Uh, though they are clinically proven, but uh, certain things also are taken on the light of what manufacturer is conveying to them. But when it comes to scientific understanding, uh, certain things can always be added. So, like uh, like I was mentioning the porosity. So, how much of a porosity you want to add? First of all, the mechanical construct of it itself. Then choice of whether you want the femoral head to be metal, ceramic, or what. And then what level of porosity you are seeking, and whether you want the implant to be biodegradable. or whether it's for a elderly person or a younger person so there are multiple uh, i mean it's not a straight forward call but there are multiple complexities and that part has to be taken you know in you know conjunction with manufacturer the clinician and the surgeon and the material and mechanical scientist so i'll say it is not simple one word answer but this is what i will uh, leave over uh mr subnis please mr subnis Okay, uh, I'll ask his question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh -huh, yes, yes. Please, please go ahead. Uh, Doctor Balani, a very nice presentation. Of course, it's not our area, so everything uh, goes over the head. But something which uh, normally you can associate with this, you talked about adding various uh, elemental materials. A uh, cobalt, as we normally know, uh, it is a toughening agent for uh, steels. so what is the function here is it also providing the same function no 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 so in typically you are adding cobalt for toughening uh, steel but here we are not adding cobalt in larger quantity we are adding very limited quantity as a dopant it means that it will get i don't know how many i am forgetting the number but it will be very less less than 1% or so much less than 1% into the matrix of hydroxyapatite and we want this cobalt to come out as an ion bind with the dna of the bacteria and then denature it or kill the bacterial surface by certain mechanisms mm -hmm. so that's right. the purpose of adding cobalt in hydroxyapatite a uh, second question was uh, you talked about a very uh, i would say high uh, higher end uh, your testing of d adhesion now this d adhesion kind of test uh, who all are doing is it possible to be done only in iits or maybe at <laughs> yes. it requires very stringent ear yeah, control because we have to take uh, by the way the importance of this i'll highlight later but we are taking a cantilever typically a cantilever will have a tip and that tip is typically silicon carbide and then we indent the material and then we see the force distance curve but here we would like to replace this tip with a single cell and then we bring it in contact and then see the deadhesion first of all isolating a single bacteria is very difficult because we cannot see so we take a solution of bacteria and if the solution has higher number of bacteria i will get multiple number of cell and then i will get response from multiple number of uh, cells not one cell that will be misrepresentation so we keep lowering the count or the concentration of bacteria in the solution till i get only one or two once i have one or two bacteria i need only one because because of distance it only one will come in contact and i will also to do fluorescent microscopy before and after the test to ensure that this is single bacteria and it stays even after the test so it's a typically very critical you know set of experiments which are required i did not get into it but this is what is required for uh, this so yes it is very tricky and very difficult it will not come out that easily but i will highlight one point dr subra suresh when I'm, when he was in mit he did nano indentation on cells and he could confidently say more than with more than 80% confidence that the person has cancer in much early stage maybe after second stage or so whereas the biopsy you know is confident only 20% that also after stage 3 
so i'm just mentioning that these mechanical testing tools are very important because once we you know once a person is getting a cancer cancer cells tends to divide very rapidly they are very soft so the stiffness of this of the cancerous cell is very low and that detection is possible using nano indentation so i'm just highlighting the importance of these tools in you know biomedical industry a uh, biomedical sciences you know we think that oh, it is not to be used there but it is very much valuable there also sir this explanation is very very uh, valid and very much uh, important for our chairman dr sudhakar bonde he heads a very uh, advanced uh, this thing you know materials testing lab yes. so possibly he can get into this nano indentation as well yes yeah your question mr bonde you are wanting to uh, ask a question mr uh, bonde yeah sir i want to know regarding any microbial corrosion studies you have done on this yes just like we do in the ness i don't know about ness but uh, what, what is ness uh, corrosion society okay ness yes okay. yes corrosion test. nac so, yes. so the no, no, no i got it i got it for corrosion yes. nac so uh, we do corrosion test uh, we have not done as per corrosion test but ceramics are typically highly insulating in nature on some other context we have tried uh, or done corrosion test on hydroxypetite they are highly insulating in nature metals on the other hand they are more corrosive they also tend to release ions and in reality or in body we do not want any metal contact with the cells we do not want so we'll always will have uh, a coating of hydroxypetite on the other hand magnesium is more or less compatible so if you are working on biodegradable implants using magnesium we have high tolerance for magnesium but not for uh, elements like nickel or say chromium they become highly you know allergic or uh, carcinogenic to the body mr selva your question Hi. Ah oh, yes sir yes sir uh, good evening sir very it was a very interesting presentation sir we enjoyed it for presentation thank, thank you so much for uh, sparing your rich your experience with us i have a question sir i i just had some of the people have you know then on the ortho operation and all some stainless steel titanium latest thing or telling stainless steel has some allergy problem and all that like that any problem will be there sir with this new material okay it oh, is by the way so i okay let me first respond to the earlier question also microbial corrosion we have not done uh, so essentially we would like this surface to be antibacterial so we are adding a entity which will make it antibacterial so i just answer the previous question i did not realize it is talking about corrosion or microbial corrosion so it will not let any microbes sit on it so if you are adding reinforcements of silver or ceria they will help in making it antibacterial and that's what is the purpose i may be i did not hear the word microbial first and now second coming to this current okay, question thank you thank and you and the current question uh, it is about uh, current implant they have like titanium aluminum vanadium aluminum is known to cause uh, neurological problems nickel is very well known to be uh, again a very uh, causes inflammation and also is toxic to body body chromium also can form hexavalent chromium and can become carcinogenic so typically metals are not preferred even we see silver in lower quantity it will lower down the bacterial con uh, bacterial infection but in little higher concentration it also starts killing the cell it starts to denature the dna so any metal contact is not preferred you will see our body has no uh, metal ions are very very i mean very very marginal so we do not want any metal to come in contact with our body internally at least thank you sir thank you thank you it was a very good answer thank you thank you sir thank you i also will highlight one more thing i think this is a biological i mean though the, the topic was more or less on biomaterial but i knew the i think the participation i mean participants will be from industry so i had pitched my talk accordingly and maybe that is the reason that many i think thought it will be bio, bio oriented and that's why the attendance is little, little thin today but i think it is fine those interested are here so i'm happy uh, for that no the talk was very interesting sir thank you thank you so much thank you so much uh, uh, uh. just taking this question of selva forward this allergy that the patient see is because of the metallic nature of the implants but metallic implants have been there for a very long time they were gold plated or people have been using gold teeth so uh, that is something which so, now okay. the new technology is telling us that it is no not good any but we should not be using them okay. at all 
so i i also mentioned it so it is also depending on the inertness of the material so if, if it is only gold not reacting anything it's fine if it stays in the body no problem automatically our body will start to develop fibroblast around it it will not interact but it will try to cover that but what will happen even if i have in body i have this implant of stainless steel or titanium i am also coating it with hydroxypetite so i'm trying to protect that but nonetheless there'll be body fluid which will try to seep in because i also require porosity in the coating mm -hmm. and from there in very long term because anything in the body will somehow be eaten away will be eaten up by our own cells they don't want any foreign body to be there in the body in our body so somehow they will start eating at a very slow rate but those metal ions can get clogged because they are active highly active they will get clogged in our brain artery heart liver kidney somewhere and they will start to make it you know dysfunctional so that's why we don't want any metal as such for the long term usage so what you are saying is that what the way the biomaterials will move is probably either use of ceramic or a ceramic uh, polymer kind of a composite which will become the norm for the for this kind of industry but that's the kind of future for biomaterials no uh, no not uh, not uh, that way because say if i have a implant say uh, hip joint made up of ceramic and polymer if right. i make or run two steps it has very poor fracture toughness it will fragment into pieces okay okay so i require so a metal it will be a much more complex composite okay yes it requires a structural integrity as well so mm -hmm. we require a metal to serve that purpose structural take the structural load mm -hmm. even our jaw line it requires some impact while something is there or so we have plates metal plates and maxillofacial implants any other questions from anybody sir one small query are is your center is i'll ask one query about him uh, is there any facility for medical device testing in your center uh, so that is in area and everybody is asking about that fabrication no, no. or no not fabrication medical devices testing as for astm and there is specific we'll report for we'll that to talk about it actually we do cell culture bacteria culture and that part we routinely do but which sort of testing is required because each device may have a different type of a testing requirement we also have an animal house but for that we need to take ethical clearance so these aspects we can test but apart from that we want to i think go for like big animals like you know uh, rabbit monkey cow that facility we do not have then for pre clinical trials and clinical trials again we will have to go to the hospital directly we cannot do it here so you are more or more or less shifting toward the clinical uh, uh, testing sort of thing we'll have to yes we cannot do it at it can not the material testing sort of thing well, material right. testing can do we can also ensure its cyto compatibility or not it will suit nicely or not but the long term tests are required somewhere else so animal testing also we can do for rats or chick but for a implant we need to go and see it on a monkey or a goat or a cow or someone else on a heavy animal When you when you come to Kanpur, you like to see your laboratory. Sure, sure. Next month we are planning to come there. Sure, I'll be happy to welcome you here. Sure. So, sir, I think we are uh, at the end of our uh, questions. Any comments from anybody, Professor Ram Krishna, Professor Ravi? Any 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 final comments? Yeah, it's again another. demonstration of uh, the india chapter leading the way in the digital world and you are reaching out all globally congratulations and wish you continued successes thank you thank you thank you thank you professor ravi and thank you thank professor uh, balani we will definitely be visiting kanpur and we will definitely try uh, definitely be liking to visit your laboratory if it would be possible so uh, with that thank you all very much uh any last words professor Bo uh, uh, mr bonde mr selva you are from trichy na no? yes sir yes sir uh, good evening sir selva ji he had so a lot of correspondence what about me members you members you are talking yes sir yes sir i am already talking to many people eh? they are telling <laughs> but they are not coming forward this thing okay now what is the result result is uh, here you know life and lifetime membership itself uh, costing less for them 
for the yearly membership of cart uh, around 4000 plus they are resistant to uh, spare it that's all problem uh-huh. otherwise you know it will be if they live membership no they are ready to but uh, our uh, membership is more it's enough that's why people are uh, hesitating to join yes life membership is high it's all it is 2000 dollars yeah, yeah they, they are comparing with the other uh, institutes of engineers institutes of metals and uh, you know other uh, indian welding society you have to compare with the american society and uh, those they are the key equivalent yeah, yeah. yeah they are comparing with that's the problem i am and <laughs> ic and ie adle be insurance i was chair man you know yes one positive news oh ah, these okay. reasons we already know everybody knows about oh. all this <laughs> we want to know the real cause and uh, the positive result from your side yes right sir right sir will i will try to try my best i'll try okay okay, okay. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you all very much yeah. thank you professor yeah. balani once again for giving us a interesting lecture thank you all i'm shutting the thank you, thank you sir thank you good night good night everyone no sir